where dozens of African American men had their pants pulled down right in public in this city right. in one of the most humiliating methods of law enforcement that anyone can possibly think of. And this judge who heard that awarded punitive damages against a police officer and the city council voted to pay for that. Just like they voted to pay for the lieutenant who framed Judy, Judy Barry, they voted to pay her punitive damages. And again, not just one person or a single person, but dozens of people are have their pants pulled down with no accountability at all. I could go through all the wrongful deaths but I, uh, that, I, that I've been involved in and that I haven't been involved in. Cases which we've been successful in getting compensation and cases that we have not. But all those people have one thing in common. They're dead. And the compensation is meaningless for them. And it's next to meaningless for their families. What we need to do is make sure those people don't die in the first place. Because what we can do as lawyers is so pathetically minimal. Uh, we have to stop it from happening in the first place. So after this went on for years and years, we had a five year period of the negotiated settlement agreement. We got some reforms done. Uh, we, it was going to be extended one time to seven years, and it was. At the end of seven years, the police department was not in compliance. And we went to the judge and we got it continued to nine years. And after nine years, the same thing, and we got it continued for 11 years. And now we're in the uh, January will be the end of the 10th year. Uh, the monitor team that was first appointed was half police officers uh, and half Justice Department lawyers. And they were chosen by the Oakland Police Department and we went along with it. And they found this department in chronic non-compliance, all the chronic non-compliance and pointed out, they pointed out the strip search problem in one of their reports years before the lawsuit was filed and the Oakland Police had listened to them then they would not have been sued and the people would not have had been humiliated the way they were. Um, that, that monitor team left. They walked out in the middle of the worst recession that this country's seen since the Great Depression. They were paid seven, eight hundred thousand a year and they walked out because they felt they could not do anymore. And that made me, who was getting 10,000 a year, feel like, <laughs> what am I doing? You know, well, what, what's going on here? So then we tried to interview another monitor team. And this one was all police. Every single one was a police, an ex-police officer, high ranking, the chief of Rochester, of Miami, a police officer, a, a guy who was a Republican and chief of police of a small town in New Hampshire. This is the current monitor team. And this is the team that's found them in chronic non-compliance again. 300 years of law enforcement experience these people have, and they've, and they've had the exact same response as the first monitor team, and as all of you. So that made me start thinking there's something going on here that's different from other cities. It makes, it makes it bad. But we had, a, but how could this be? We had a liberal democratic mayor. We had a progressive city council. Well, I'll tell you that that city council has never, ever in all the years asked John and I to go there and to tell them what is wrong, or why we're doing what we're doing, or had any investigation whatsoever, or any accountability of, pol of the police at any time. Not a single council member has reached out to me uh, for the first 11 years of NSA, first 10 years of NSA. Recently, it started to happen a little bit. Uh, Mayor Dellums never met with us or the monitor, not a single time. Never, never came to a meeting the entire time that he was mayor. 
And that's because they're afraid. They're afraid of crime. They're afraid of being bad now. They're afraid of the, of the union. They're afraid, period. It's just not uh, politically acceptable to help poor people who may not vote because they have felonies or because they're just working so hard they can't get it together. So those people are forgotten by our elected leaders. And it really makes no difference what their liberal conservative bent is. It's the exact same response. In fact, it's worse here than elsewhere, in my experience. So it came to 2011, and then Occupy Oakland happened. And Occupy Oakland proved to me that this process is broken and a failure because the response was exactly, this characterized exactly the same way as the response to the port by the media. The worst, the worst response by any law enforcement agency on the CNN, on Jon Stewart, every single place across the country, they were characterized as the worst. And they were the worst. So they hired Tom Frazier, another in a series of endless consultants the city has paid for, to tell them they're doing a good job. <laughs> Tom Frazier looked like it was going to go okay. He was chief of police of Baltimore. He was a San Jose police officer for over 20 years. And what did he conclude? That the Oakland Police Department is not a learning organization that they have systemic failures that are historically and, uh, and legacy of systemic failure, that their leadership is lacking, that their own police officers said that their investigatory tools are a failure. Do you see Tom Frazier here today? No, because he didn't give the city elected people what they were looking for, and he is gone. And now we have law firms People say, well, a receiver, that's going to be really expensive. Well, right now they're spending $800,000 hiring a, a law firm bonanza for a, a, to investigate the Occupy cases. And there will be no sustainability when those people leave, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Because when they leave, their knowledge goes with them, and it's back to the same old, same old, and internal affairs of OPD. So I concluded that after Occupy that something was wrong. And then I went to Detroit. I was invited by the Monitor team to go to Detroit. And Detroit proved to me beyond any doubt that there was a real problem here. I went to Detroit. Detroit has a higher crime rate than Oakland. Detroit has lost half of its population since 1967. Detroit has lost a quarter of its population since 2000. Detroit is on the verge of bankruptcy. Detroit has a huge crime problem. Detroit has the same monitoring team that Oakland has. They have 190, something like that, different tasks where Oakland has 23. <laughs> Unlike um, Oakland, Detroit has to comply each time with every single test. They don't get to, when they comply like in Oakland, we let them, when they comply with the test, it's dropped from the list. In Detroit, it's all over again, every quarter, 190. Wow. Detroit's gone from 29% compliance to 85% compliance. In the same time, Oakland has made virtually no progress whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Nothing. When I went to Detroit, I saw the police officers there welcoming the monitoring team. They were happy to see them. And we're not, I'm not a, 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 a Pollyanna. I understand that Detroit Police Department has problems. But guess how many people were shot and killed in Detroit last year? One. Do you know what that person did? He came into the police department. He shot two cops. He had a gun. It's on YouTube. You can see it. Okay, that's the one person who was killed in Detroit last year. Mm -hmm. With a population double of Oakland. Uh -huh. You have a likelihood of approximately 20 times greater of having a firearm drawn on you in Oakland than in Detroit. 
in Detroit complains her down. I got on the, I could go on and on about the collaborative approach there, about the command accountability meetings they have there where people like you can come and they go precinct by precinct. What have you done about crime? How many complaints do you have? What are you doing about civil rights violations? The whole command staff sits up there and grills these people and they better come through. Have you ever seen that in Oakland? I sure have. And we never will unless we demand it and make it happen. I got on the plane in April and I realized that we had to change the paradigm. That John and I were actually enabling uh, this kind of bad behavior by pretending that we were accomplishing something. And so we filed the receiver motion because we do not want to meet with these people anymore and beg them to do the right thing. We don't want to read any more monitor reports anymore that basically says how bad they are and then they get up there and it's year after year. I've seen this. We promise you within three months we'll be in compliance. Deveragedly, the six month plan, the three month plan, the one year plan, the PowerPoint presentations, <laughs> and it's all belonging. It's all, it, none of it has ever happened. Endless promises unkept by the OPD in court in front of Judge Henderson. Promises that if you or I made, oh Judge, we'll pay our fine in six months. Mm -hmm. If you came back and didn't pay your fine, what would happen? Yeah. Well, what happens with the OPD is they make the same promise again and again and again. And they, it's just, I'm promised out. I'm promised out because we can't wait for another Occupy Oakland. We can't wait for someone else to be shot with no accountability. We can't wait for another class action where people have their pants pulled down and are humiliated because they're African American. We cannot wait any longer to uh, not try every last thing, including the drastic remedy of receivership. Now, what is a receivership? The receivership's different because right now what we have is the monitor says how bad they are. And then they say they won't do it again. And then the judge gives a speech. And then I give a speech. I've given all these speeches. I've quoted from Winston Churchill. I've quoted uh, from Martin Luther King. I've quoted from Malcolm X. And I'm tired of quoting and, and going through this ridiculous uh, uh, ceremony that beams 